The cool thing about an experiment, you don't know what, what the outcome will be. Okay. Or else it's not an experiment. Yeah. Right? This is what I don't like about business cases. You're focused on too much on, on what the outcome needs to be. Yeah. But now they're asking, hey, that's an experiment. Try to figure out what the cheapest version of fail is, but and how do you capture feedback? And that's such a different way of coming up with ideas and yeah. bringing them to life in Miro. Sid, how's it going? Pretty good. Yeah. How are you? Yourself? I'm all right. Bit awkward being in the middle of Miro face to face, <laughs> but it's all good. I'm delighted to be here. Um, we've just had a great tour. Uh, for the second time, we've been collaborating um, with one of my clients, which is the TGA in Saudi Arabia. And we had them in and they walked them around and stuff. Now, one of the pieces that I feel is really, really fitting to the audience of the Human Centered Design Network is the work mm -hmm. that you particularly are doing right. in here around the Living Lab. Before we jump into that, maybe you'll tell us a little bit about yourself and your role at Miro. Yeah, so my name is Sid van Wijk. Um, I'm based in Amsterdam, worked for Miro for two years now. I lead their strategic engagement programs, yeah. uh, which is two things, uh, the, our customer advisory boards and our executive briefing centers, which we call the Miro Discovery Center. So I lead both of those programs. So what's the what's the outcome of those pieces like? So that's that's kind of what you do, but what are you hoping to achieve by doing that work? Got it. So my focus is really to meet with our top clients, but in person. So this building yeah. where we are, which you call the Living Lab, um, yeah. here in Amsterdam, our headquarters, where we could meet with these customers in person to really build a stronger relationship with, but also tell. Um, this is the thing with, with perception, right? In, in a yeah. world where everything changes really fast, technology changes really fast, we change really fast as a company, perception usually doesn't, right? So mm. we are 13 years old. And yeah, 13 we, years old today. Here we go. It, it's our birthday, super cool. It's my birthday. And they're visiting, so nice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we actually have people visiting on our birthday, really cool. Um, <laughs> we started with whiteboarding, yeah. right? And this is the thing, well, once you see us as whiteboarding, it's very difficult for us to move that perception, right? If right. you look at Miro now, it's so much more. And when we spend a day together here and just talk about it, yeah. we can really change that perception and really get you thinking about all the stuff you can do with Miro, which is so much more than just whiteboarding. That, yeah. That's like 10% of it. Yeah. yeah. So like, First of all, this is not a commercial. This is not, I know it looks like we've got the brand and all that kind of stuff here, but it's just the perfect room for a podcast. I use your tool and I've been on the journey from 2011 to now. So real time board into Miro. And in that time, my kind of uh, usage of it has shifted from just a place to put research mm. to um, really how I work and how I run my business. Yeah, cool. Is that kind of like the same trajectory? Is yeah. that like, uh, am I part of the flow of the evolution of Miro? Is that what you want your customers to be doing? Well, I, I like that you say that because, in a sense, you could say that work happens on a Miro board, mm. right? I mean, we have this building, work happens in a building, but I think that is more supportive mm. of where work happens because we all know that work actually happens on, on, on the laptop in a tech stack, right? Yeah, We want to be that connecting tissue where we are this hub integrating with everything. So when mm. you have this idea, this project, it all lands a Miro and you can end to end build yeah. it from there. Right? Okay. So, and, and the cool thing is we, we have formulated a mission statement when we were, uh, when we were born thir uh, 13 years ago, yeah. and it's still the same. And that's really focused on um, empowering teams to create the next big thing. Right, so mm. the focus is on teams getting them on a mirror board, right, and really helping them with that innovation process, right, yeah. an idea that becomes that next big thing, whatever that is, right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's so much more than whiteboarding. No? Yeah, it, with the pandemic, mm. like just going back to that, because I, I remember, you know, one of your competitors, uh, I was doing a little bit of work with them at that point, and they mentioned that there was a hockey stick moment of adoption. Yeah. So they just said, look, it's the growth is just absolutely out of this world. Yeah. So I found myself running my business, running all the training, running coaching uh, through Miro, okay? And now we find ourselves in that hopefully post-pandemic world. I don't know if it's still safe enough to say that. I feel like a bit like in a movie. If I say it out loud, it might actually come back. Yeah. But if- Don't jinx it. <laughs> don't jinx it, it didn't happen. Um, but one of the things that I really liked about when we, we were catching up and connecting is the approach 
to the hybrid model mm. between people who are working from home and people who are in the office. Yeah, interesting. And yeah. We spent a, a long time today chatting about that, that evolution, because people are still distributed and they're still working remotely. And it creates this kind of um, this gap or this, I don't even think it's an uncanny valley, but it's, it seems like an, a, a sort of a point where you could say it. But you had a lot of um, kind of intel in that space and how you see dialing people in who are mm. working from home and giving them the equity so they're not seen as a, you know, a second class. Exactly. Uh, we're all first class. We're all, we're all first class. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your experiments Got it. and what it, you used. Yeah. And, and we have a huge culture of experimentation at Miro. And we, we do know that before the pandemic, we were like 250 people and now we're nearing 2,000, right? Massive right, growth okay. over a very short uh, time. Yeah. We had one office before the pandemic, now we have 13. Was this the office? No, this was not the office, okay. right? Well, um, we, one across the road? One, we had it in Amsterdam, smaller one, but we had to grow. And now we are about 900 people here in Amsterdam. Okay, so yeah. we're outgrowing this even. Yeah. But we didn't know how we had to work together in person, right? Because yeah. we grew this much over the pandemic. And, and the cool thing, what you really see in the culture of Miro, a lot of people discovered Miro during the pandemic because yeah. they had to find tools to work together to collaborate. And a lot of those people like j jumped on, like, oh, that's exciting. And they joined in that excitement. So you really see that in the culture. I find that really cool. Yeah. But we had to discover what our ways of working was going to be because we had so limited experience with in-person and what, what did that mean? And the pandemic was very predictable eh? because every call was virtual. You know exactly what type of meeting it was going to mm. be. You had only 16 steps from back to office, right? Um, and now we're all in person. Now we have so many new flavors to add to the mix. And we had to figure out what does that mean for us? And we yeah. didn't know. And to figure that out, to learn, we set up a concept which we call the Living Lab. And yeah. this is like the blueprint here in Amsterdam, one mm. of the offices where we set up everything for experimentation. So if you look at Living Lab, uh, two components to it, right? Living, meaning that it, it, um, it's changing, right? You need to make sure that what you bring in is movable so you can change. You can move yeah. it out in and, and redecorate as such. And you need to make sure that you can swap it efficiently as well. And for, for that reason, we have the far majority of furniture and technology on subscription, okay. which means that if you look at this office and you look around, we don't own it. And for example, a chair could have an SLA of three weeks. If we don't like it, we could change it really fast okay. based on feedback. Yeah. The other part, so that's the living part. Everything is on wheels, right? Everything we can change and bring back and swap it out. Mm. The lab aspect of it is that is where we invite everyone to the experimentation. But that's yeah. customers, that's internal as well. Because they know that we can change, they're very likely to give feedback. Yeah. So we have multiple ways to to get that feedback in if they don't like a space or they're looking for something else. Yeah. They know we can change. And because they know, they give they're more, more like feedback. Give feedback. And this is the blueprint. And now we have 13 offices. So what we learn here, we distribute to the others as okay. well. So I mean, when we were chatting earlier on, I was explaining about the business model canvas, which mm -hmm. is a strategizer tool. And one of the elements in there is the customer relationship. And what I can see is the key to unlocking all of this experimentation is the, uh, the leasing of the furniture. That's mm -hmm. unlocked an awful lot of those bits where before we might have said, no, we can't do that. But it's a, it's a subscription. Right? It's not even lease. Because the okay, cool thing a about subscription is it's a monthly fee. So we partner with, a, uh, with an agency. We just ask, what is the square meter? How many yeah. people do you need to cater for? We're oh, bringing a version okay. one. And every month, you pay a, a, a fixed amount. Per, per person in the building, is it? Um, well, it's all brought together on a, on a single okay. amount, right? right? But that doesn't increase when you swap something out, right? So okay. the room we were in today, I yeah. always say that that's on the version five. Yeah. And we figured out that there, there were whiteboard tables. I love that. So I reached out, we could have that. And, and now we have this new way of collaborating on the tables. I think yeah, that's yeah, super Yeah, absolutely. Cool. No, it's yeah. just, it's so cool because experimentation is one of the things that we're trying to foster within the service design community as well. That whole kind of willingness to take the leap to, to really experiment. Mm. And it seems to be part of the DNA in here. So how do you get the word out there to people like the other employees that, hey, it's okay to experiment and it's yeah. not, you know, a bad thing to suggest changes because yeah. that's a cultural piece. Yeah. Just don't ask them to build a business case. Yeah. 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 Pretty much. Um, yeah. It's, um, they see the change. 
right? Yeah. So, for example, when they gave feedback on a on a room, we, you know, those happy or not totems on the airport, yeah. right? With the sentiment analysis, usually we put them out when there is a change, so people have this visual trigger, like, oh, something changed. Then we can get the sentiment of it as well. So, mm. because they provide feedback, and we change based on it, and they see we did something, so yeah. it means that we're listening. They're going to provide more feedback after that as well, and and this spreads quite fast internally mm. as well. But in the end, this is more expensive, huh? but yeah. you'll build it. You you're building in so much innovation because you're not locked in, and it always feels new. Yeah. But we learned so much throughout these two years doing this that we now have a really good understanding of what the balance is that we're going for. How many collaboration spaces do you need? What do they look like? How many desks do you need in an office, sure. for example? We're going to a new office, uh, I think in a half year's time, mm. and we have a really good grip on how we think that should look like and what the best office is. Yeah. yeah. So there's two questions to this. One, who watches the metrics and Got who, it. who basically does that? Yeah. Maybe that's the first part we'll answer, and I'll come back to the second part. Well, uh, we, we have a, a workplace team which is really focused on this when you talk about workplace, and so there is someone dedicated on tracking all this data and setting up the feedback loops and, and, mm. and extracting data from that. We have multiple ways to really figure out, okay, how do we capture feedback? How do we bring that in? So a survey is one. The mm. totems are another thing, right? Yeah, yeah. But we also have focus groups where we're really trying to figure out with maybe a department or a team of what is your way of working. Yeah. We also do a lot of observation. So we have one large room. It's enormous. We call mm -hmm. it the, the Miro Dojo. This is where our agile teams go. Okay, yeah. And it's full. It's, it's, there's too much in there. Too yeah. much furniture, too much technology. <laughs> But they can just grab whatever. They set themselves up for success. They take a screen, another screen, could be different brands constantly because we're experimenting with that as well. Yeah. And then we're trying to figure out, okay, what did they actually use? And then we ask, okay, was that good? Okay. Right? So the, the flip side of that question about who's measuring it, um, and yeah, sure enough, people give feedback and say they like it. It's part of the lab. You're not a lab. You can yeah. run an experiment. The cool thing about an experiment, you don't know what, what the outcome will be. Okay. Or else it's not an experiment. Yeah. Right? This is what I don't like about business cases. You're focused on too much on, on what the outcome needs to be. Yeah. But now they're asking, hey, that's an experiment. Try to figure out what the cheapest version to fail is. But And how do you capture feedback? Mm. And that's such a different way of coming up with ideas and yeah. bringing them to life in Miro. So there's like a, the, the bit why I'm, I'm probing on this one a little bit more is, People will listen to it and people in their businesses might say, well, we couldn't do that because we have to have a justification on what the outcome is. Like, mm. is, it, is it better, you know, outputs in terms of the quality of the outputs, the quality of the collaboration, the quality? Is, it, is there a business metric that we can put against this well, to show that it's working? It would be great if you can find something which yeah. is measurable, right? I, I'm, I'm not saying that the full company needs to go in this direction. Yeah. But you do need to find, figure out what are the pocket scenarios where we can do this with, right? And what yeah. can we create a, a, a section or a part of the office or a part of a team which is free to to do this, right? Yeah, yeah, and absolutely. Uh, it, that, that's difficult to get to, but there are so many learnings, and I think the learnings once you share those learnings internally, I hope that will help. To do it again and yeah, do it again absolutely. and go bigger and go bigger, right? So yeah. going all the way back yeah. to the remote sessions. So whenever you've got right. um, live calls with people and people, as you said, you've got a good scenario there. Like, oh, I need to pick the kids up. I'm going to do that one in the right. car versus I'm going to do it on a cafe or, um, you know, I'm sick. I'm home in bed and I don't want to show my face. So we're either driver behind hybrid. Right? Yeah. So, so hybrid. A hybrid engagement is, or a hybrid meeting, when you have an audience in, in front of you, right? Yeah. And an audience which is not there, remote, right? Yeah. And that happens to us, right? And the driver is so important because it is not that we plan for a hybrid. It is not that we book a meeting and say, I'm going to, um, not these people are going to go remote and these people I'm going to invite. It's not going to go like that. You set mm -hmm. up a meeting and people are going to decide if they're going to join. Remotely okay. or in person. Right? Yeah. So to your point, I'm going to pick up the kids. It's a personal driver. You decide that you want to pick up the kids, so you decide to take the rest of the day uh, yeah. uh, virtual, virtually yeah. remote, right? Sure. And that is when hybrid happens. And yeah. the difficulty around this is the expectation towards it. Yeah. It is not that you have a meeting here. Do you look at your calendar and say, ah, 
um, that that is acceptable to do remotely or anything. I've started to do it a lot more where I gauge and say, well, actually, I, I know that person. Yeah. I've worked with them. If they're a collaborator, then I'll do it on the fly. Yeah. In terms of on the fly, I could do it in a coffee shop. I could be yeah. out and about shopping. But if it's a client, I'm definitely at my desk. Yeah. Like, yeah. I still feel that draw for professionalism to be there, to have the high quality camera, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Very cool. It's, it's, yeah. We started calling it this whole thing a paradox. Yeah. And really because everyone wants flexibility. And it, sure. I asked our recruiters and they said it's like a top three question, right? They, the, the, the person we're interviewing, they're asking, what, what does it mean to you? What is flexibility? Where can I work, right? What, mm-hmm. Do we have fixed office hours or what, what is it like? But they also, so they want that. They want to have the work-life balance. Yeah. But on the other end, they also want to be as involved and yeah. as the rest. And they want to have a similar experience as the rest right yeah and th- this makes it hard huh yeah absolutely so you, how can you combine both right and that, yeah. that gives the that feels that feels like a paradox yeah, yeah. so in the sen- uh, scenario you went this morning where we were saying okay well you've got the camera behind you mm. the, the boot cam as you call yeah. it where it's <laughs> focusing on your your rear which is usually a camera which is you see in, in meeting rooms when there is this screen for you, which is clearly focused on sitting, yeah. right? sitting workshops, and the camera is on table height. Yeah. But once you present and stand in front of the screen, that is at a weird height, right? Yeah. The butt cam. Yeah. yeah. So you kind of have to get out of your way, and then people are forced to be doing a little bit of this, and then they might get get a bit of the armpit kind yeah. of perspective and stuff. And, and this is how we build a relationship with them, I guess. Hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah pretty much. <laughs> and like, and then you turn around and they might see the screen. Yeah. It's, it's clunky for the want of a better word. And one of the alternate kind of solutions that we were saying, well, maybe you could have a 360 camera on the table yeah. where the, the people joining, they get more visibility of all the people there. Um, you tried that. How did it go? But the thing is, that is great visibility for the people at home. Mm. But when, when you have that 360 cam, uh, no one talks to it. Yeah. And so it means if, if there, there is a 360 cam, I'm not going to talk to that camera because I don't see you there, right? Yeah. I'm going to see you here. So I'm going to talk to you where I see you. Yeah. But if the camera is now there, it will look at my ear. So it will not feel spoken to. Yeah. So there is a disconnect and I'm trying to figure out what is the most natural of setup. Mm. So I always make sure that the camera, the microphone and the screen where I see you yeah. are amongst the audience, yeah. which is in the far majority of rooms I've seen and I've, I've seen a lot. They are, uh, uh, yeah, the party sound. The party's you know. going through. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully the mics are picking yeah, us up. Yeah, we need to go deeper here. Yeah. Um, the far majority of rooms have this one screen with a camera fixed to it, right? So now I'm, I'm talking to a room full of people and I'm going to address them because I get feedback from them. A lot of communication is non-verbal, right? They're going to nod. I'm going to talk to that person. And the rest is now watching my back, right? And yeah. it's very easy for me for, to forget them because I don't see them. I cannot do this constantly. That's going to be exhausting. Don't yeah. feel natural. We do a lot of we have a concept which we call the facilitator gym. So we do training sessions, right? It's a yeah, muscle. You need to build that. And we do testing sessions for hybrid. And within two minutes, everyone forgot the remote participants. Oh, right? really? Yeah, very really fast, very really fast. Because yeah. we don't see them. So, so this is what I do, right? Yeah. Um, I, I, play, I make sure that there is a second screen. Because I want to separate content from people screens. Yeah. Because I don't want to compromise, right? I okay. want cl- this is my slides. That's that's what I want to show. I don't want that to mix with the video conferencing and the people. Yeah. I need that to be slide, and I need another screen amongst the audience where I can see you. Okay. So we can talk to you, right? Yeah. And those there's a camera presumably on that. Because I yeah. am going to look at the screen, and you feel looked at if the camera is there as well. And can you position that? In the so they've got the same perspective of the people you're pre- presenting to that are in the room physically in the room. I always let's say this is the table, right? And yeah. I'm presenting here in the screen behind me. This is like a large boardroom table. I always place it here next to the screen, okay. so they're close to me, so they can yeah. hear me better, so they feel closer to me. And now the rest of the table can also see them. Yeah. So the rest of the audience will not forget about them either. Okay. Right. And now I have more. The cameras which are in there are um, they can easily hear me. 
because it's close. Yeah. Right? I can place it at the far end of the table, which I've seen rooms doing that as well. But now all the audience here, they will look at me presenting and they will forget them. Okay. Makes sense, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I make sure that this is on wheels. So I can roll it in. Yeah, right. absolutely. So it's like one bit I really liked. It's like it's equitable design in that sense that you're giving you know, the same emphasis to the people in the room as you are. So you've, you've got a like a parking space at the table, exactly. so to speak, for people to dial in. That's the remote space. And I, I, this, this part of the table is blocked. No one sits there. That's for everyone who is remote sitting there. Right? Okay, So, so they feel like they're sitting on the table. That, that's the feeling I want to give to someone who's not there. So do you have like, a, is it a, a screen that fits on a, a on a chair? Because I've seen this, I don't know if you know the TV yeah. show, Silicon Valley. Yeah. They had something like that before. I think it was in Hooli, if anyone remembers that, where they dial in and there's a screen on the top of the chair but, and they're like, hi, everyone. <laughs> I remember these meetings where I was the only person dialing in and they had this screen, which was 65 inch uh, large and I was the only person dialing in. So my hat was big on the screen <laughs> and it was against the window. So I saw the reflection in the meeting. So I saw how big a presence I had in that meeting. It felt very awkward. Yeah. Um, we have um, a, uh, a neat frame. That neat is the brand, Norwegian brand, gorgeous brand. Um, which is like this big, right? Okay. Portrait size. And often it is only one person dialing in. Yeah. I just put that on a near a chair. So okay. they feel like they're on the table. That, okay. is, that feels very cool. Yeah. So, so that whole kind of um, lim liminal or um, kind of in between states, yeah. like the, the great edge of experiences, as I say in the podcast, seems to be an area that is evolving. From the perspective of Sid and not the perspective of Miro, wh where do you see the future of online and real world collaboration going? You're rubbing your face, going to go, no, don't ask me this question. Well, well, I'm trying like, to think what I mean. I mean, if you'd have said to us five years ago that we were still facing these challenges, you might have been mm. like, oh, I thought we would have tackled it by now. Yeah. What does it look like in another five years? No, we have a lot of learnings, but we're far from there, right? It yeah. doesn't feel like we have a best practice towards it yet. Mm. I like the whole concept of uh, asynchronous collaboration yeah. because I think we need to expand our thinking of a meeting. When we have a meeting, it feels like, oh, that's synchronous, present, we're all there, right? Mm -hmm. But I think what, there's a lot more to it in the preparation of it. We all know that we, we work from home, we feel more effective. Yeah. I think when we send up the meeting, it needs to have some sort of a homework where we say, hey, let's already capture some ideas, let's do some alone thinking on it and bring that to the engagement so yeah we all know the meeting culture is not it's it feels a bit broken uh, yeah we have too many meetings uh for when it was a pandemic it was like back to back it was exhausting yeah, absolutely and for a tree which made it even more exhausting yeah and i think we're all trying to figure out a way that we can be more productive in that sense mm. this morning i shared as well let's try to figure out how we can let go of nine to five right in the example of creative workers the what I don't want is interruption, right? That's a huge killer of creativity. Mm. So they're trying to find ways where they can work in a space and time where there is limited interruption. And that could as well be at home after 10. Yeah. Right. So maybe because of that, because the nine to five model of 40 hour work week is, is designed 100 years ago for factory yeah. workers. Yeah. What does it mean to knowledge workers? And mm. you say five years ahead, but we, we've been working in the same way for 100 Absolutely. years. Right. Yeah. So, I, I could mention stuff like VR, right? Which yeah. I think is it, it has possibilities in it and it's going to be a flavor of collaboration and we're looking at it and it's, yeah. it's going to be super cool once it's there. But it will, it will take time for adoption. But there is so much potential. In well, when you like frame that. it that way, though, it's almost like we're at the beginning. Yeah. You know what I mean, like we're kind of seeing the end of we, some of these patterns of... We need more people to experiment. With yeah, it, and more people to just throw it open and saying that this is what works for us. This is what we're trying. It, it would be kind of cynical enough of me to say that it's a selling point from a HR perspective that there's a huge amount of flexibility to attract top talent. Yeah, that's obviously a huge driver as well for for this. Is the requirement for mere employees to come back into the office a certain amount of days, set days a week? Well, not, not a requirement, right? But yeah. we are actively looking for good reasons. Yeah, to come in. Right? Okay, we, yeah. we want it to make sense that you're in the office. We want your office day to be different than working from home. We want okay. you to design it as such. If you're having the same, if you're coming to an office, just to sit in the phone booth to have Zoom calls, then, then we need to pointless. redesign it. And, and yeah. a lot of people have that feeling, right? It was mandatory. I had to go to the office. And I, I love to ask customers that when you meet someone in the hallway and you ask why you're here. 
and and that's quiet. And I said, what will they say? And they say like, well, I had to, I had to be in yeah, the office. Yeah, like, yeah. That, that is all the wrong reasons. Right? Yeah, I know some of the other big tech companies, that's kind of their mantra. Like you need to be three days a week, two days from home. But the, so, the thing is also how we measure it because- So what are you measuring? Tell, tell us like, tell us more about that. Well, we need to focus more on outcome of it, but yeah. we do need to share, share that widely. And for example, standing in line in coffee can be very productive. You might yeah. meet someone who you get share a project blocker with. And he's yeah. going to point you to someone who can help you out. Try to measure that. Yeah. But we all know that there's productivity. It's like hidden productivity. But that that was good, right? Yeah. How do you create that in a virtual world, right? Mm. That's that's uh, serendipity. Yeah. So for me, that there is there is a lot of value in coming in for that to happen, and we need to create a space for that to happen. So if you go into an office and you have back to back. Yeah, it's pointless. Then you can't, don't you? Then you don't create room for it either. Yeah. Yeah. So th- those kind of spaces are, and I love the fact because like, you know I've been going on my own journey with regards to creating space for that creative thought mm-hmm. to occur, and becoming better at having my meetings maybe in the first couple of hours of the day, and then just freeing it up. Yeah. Um, is that something that you're seeing that new employees come in and need to be coached into this kind of way of thinking? Is because there will definitely be people carrying from other tech companies who work differently and think differently. Yeah. How, how do you get them to release that tension? So with Miro, we see that this is coming from top down. Okay. So when I want to have a meeting with our COO, for example. Who, who's, that's right, yeah, bad yeah, joke. A lot of people dancing <laughs> there. Um, he wants to, he's asking me to add something to the meeting where I share what I'm expecting from the meeting. And okay. we always add a Miro board to the meeting, which has a uh, recording, we call that's a talk track, yeah. where I briefly explain to him, and he can play it in 1.5 speed if he wants, uh, what I want, yeah. right? So we can make a decision in like 10 minutes, right? right? So they are actively trying to work with us in such a way, and because it's coming down on us, yeah. we see that other people are ha- um, starting to adopt it more easily. Yeah. Right? And yeah. It's it's really important because, you know, that whole kind of permission to work autonomously mm-hmm. is what's missed in an awful lot of organizations. So the permission to have that control of your own day doesn't happen by chance. Yeah. So there's leaders, there's middle management, a lot of people to enable it. Is there um, any drawbacks to this that you can see? I'm trying to play devil's advocate again here in terms yeah. of like, so much control, so much flexibility. What what is the potential to go wrong? I, I, I think people we have so many different working styles together. Mm. And I think some people flourish yeah. with this model and they can grab ownership of their agenda and they can deal with it really well. Yeah. Right. And others struggle with it more. Now the complexity is that these different personas are yeah. usually in one team. Yeah. And they do they do need to work together and the example i shared earlier with you this morning from a junior developer let's say sure has a lot to learn right wants to eavesdrop on other conversations other conversation with more senior wants to ask that quick question because that is for him to speed up right and to learn and to do um, accelerate his career but the other will see that as interruption as well yeah so they are thinking, I don't want the interruptions, killing so much creativity. I'm going to start working from home. Yeah. So you see where this that is going, for a long time. right? No, yeah. no one. Yeah. Then, then this junior developer goes to the office, sees no one's around, and they will stop coming to an office. Yeah. And so this needs to be managed, but it needs to be managed in such a way that, if, that you really say, okay, these are collaboration hours. This is fine where you have that interruption. Mm. Uh, that is, that is going to be good for someone more struggling for the other, mm. and that, but it needs to come together. We need to find that common ground in there, and so, I think I think that's super difficult. Absolutely, like th- there's no one answer to it. I remember, if I've got my headphones on, don't come near me. That was one of my my cues. Yeah, um, I remember working with Luke, this phenomenal Dutch guy actually, who's nice to have a business with, 
and he used to dream of having a red flag come up on his, he was a, he was a developer, yeah. red flag comes up as in like, absolutely do not come near me. Yeah. You know, and he had all these quantifiable metrics about like I'd lose 25 minutes of, of my thinking because process. Because a quick question. But he's right. Because if you ask a quick question before you're back to the same level of focus, it will take you 20 minutes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, Luke was saying this stuff to me um, 2007. Okay, cool. And um, we were working in an ad agency, hat tip to TBWA there. And um, he, he was like, people would perceive him as probably being a little bit grumpy, uh. but because he was being forced to work in a loud environment full of interruptions, you know, a creative director didn't have a clue, banging big drums and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And he was like, I just want to work from home. Yeah. But people at th those days was like, why would you work from home? Like, you know, like they'll think that you're not working and stuff. Yeah, I so, hear there's a lot. Yeah, like that's, it's this whole kind of um, a, a trust issue at its core. I think so. So. Well, and, and the funny thing is when I ask someone, why do you work from home? Mm. It's often the reply is that they feel more productive. And yeah. To me, that makes a lot of sense as well, because when you're at home, you have more focus time to, yeah. to create, to build. And usually that leads to an end product, which is quite tangible. You yeah. wrote something. So now you feel productive because I'm, I, I made this. Yeah. Right? And when you're in office and you're drinking coffee, there is productivity in it. Just, yeah. It's different not different types of product. Yeah, exactly. Different different types. Yeah. But we do need to balance that out, right? Is it possible, or maybe you are already doing it, because a lot of my questions here today have been kind of successfully answered. The stuff of going to the coffee bar and you know, having that serendipity and synchronization of people versus I've created this new document, this outcome that can mm. be shared amongst people. Are, are either of those, well, this one is measurable. This one here is a little bit harder to, to yeah. measure. Yeah. So do, do you expect people to take out their phones and kind of go, tick, had a conversation at the coffee bar? Is that possible? Or yeah. That experience, I mean, you could probably visually look at how many people are taking coffees. Or I don't know. Yeah, yeah. But it's good that we need to know, right? Yeah. Um, but it also means that we need to figure out new ways of measuring. Yeah. yeah. At its core, the, like the reason why I was speaking to Bushra, who's in the Saudi government, and I was saying to them, this at its core is service design. Okay. You're creating the factors for collaboration, for alignment to occur. You're thinking in terms of a living lab, the things that come together. Music. It feels like the end of a podcast, right? Yeah, wait, it, wait, it feels like the, the, oh, yeah, they're doing my track. Right? They're, they're doing the auto track yeah. coming in. <laughs> um, it is their 13th birthday today, folks. So um, we've got to give them a bit of a break. But, um, and I'm not hanging around for the party, just so yeah. you know, I need to fly back to Dublin. Yeah, you're lost. But going on that, like too often people focus on the creation of services that get out into the hands of people, the customers and stuff. Yeah. It seems that you in particular are very focused, almost like an employee perspective where you've got a huge focus on enabling some of these things to occur. Mm. Where is Miro at in its own service design journey? Like, is that something that, it seems like you mentioned there that there's, um, I don't know what you what, what team you refer to, who me measure the metrics, yeah. but employee experience, is that something that that language and that terminology has been bounced around? Yeah, a lot. Yeah. Right, yeah. And we have a team dedicated on it. It's not just a, a project, it's a full-on, program where we're constantly trying to figure out what that means, right? Because I think that is that is new, what employee experience means. And we're yeah. also trying to figure out what, in these new ways of working, there, there are a lot of new things which we need to figure out because the, the experience from someone who is hired to be remote, and a lot of companies have that, right? yeah. is a different experience for someone who's always connected and near an office and you, this is what I like where, we, where my team start up. We, we ask, okay, what is the digital twin of first class, right? Because when yeah. someone is here and you eat the food, you meet the people, and we did a tour earlier, right, of yeah. the office, we can create the first class experience in person. We're quite good at that, right? Yeah. But what does it mean for the person who is not there? What is the equivalent of those things? Yeah. And I think we don't know yet what it is, and it, it comes with a lot of creativity and testing and, and trying new things. But we do need to think about it in a different way. Mm -hmm. We cannot copy the in-person experience, what we know, and because we've always worked together in person, and now we have this new flavor, we cannot copy this there, right? Yeah. Because it has its own strength, for its sure. own experience. So we need to figure out what's the employee experience for the people who are often not there. 
Yeah. What are they doing and we're touring, for example? Absolutely. Right. So I'm going to start coming towards the end of this one, but like I want to talk to you a little bit more around the new office space. Mm. The new office space, um, one of the bits that several of the people that I was bringing around today from the class, um, the service design class that I was teaching for the last week, they, they really mentioned the fact that what you're learning here can then finally be moving from prototype into something that's much more high fidelity, mm -hmm. like a fixed office that Miro are taking over yeah. in south of Amsterdam. Is it? Yeah, sure. So where are you at with this? And like, t maybe tell, tell us some of the key points that you've, you've pulled yeah. out of this learning living lab experience that it's going to define what that looks like. Well, it's, it, it's a lab because we're learning, but mm -hmm. we are learning. Do you so, lose something when you move to that space? Yeah. We're going to lose. What are we lose in particular? We're gonna, we, we are going to expand rooms. Um, yeah. And we're going to air put conditioning. teams closer to oh, air conditioning. <laughs> For everyone listening, this is a mon monumental, canal adjacent city center building. It's gorgeous. Right? Beautiful, yeah. It's difficult. Today we were in a room and the air, con air conditioning is not good. We were in the only room where where a window can actually open and still to open. Yeah, so it's um, yeah. we're going to a new building and I'm really happy about it for air conditioning and new cabling for for sure. Yeah. One of the learnings that we had from this building is that the workday is really complex. It is not just that you're coming to an office to collaborate and for social the big chapters of it and good reasons to come in. Yeah. But a workday has so much heads down work, so much focus time in it. It has throughout all of the different meetings, it has that where you just need to sit down with your laptop or have yeah. a one on one, right? This is the far majority of, of yeah. um, building blocks of a day. When we opened this office, we had 40% of everything that we brought in were desks. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was not enough. And now we're nearing 80%. Right? So, what does that tell you? That we had to get rid of a lot of. Uh, Meeting, meeting rooms, collaboration spaces. Mm. Um, we wanted to make sure that we have, well, we had that flexibility mm. because we have that living concept. Yeah. So we could easily just say that room, that room, that room, take out the couch, roll in a desk. Yeah. Right. Because that's what we need. So now we know that we needed that. And because now we have a better balance, mm. it is more attractive to come to an office. So now we... Yeah. I think the occupancy of this building is around 70%. Okay. Which is high. Which is, high, yeah, which high, is really yeah. high. Post pandemic. But it also, and, and do know this is Amsterdam, eh? so it, it's, it is cultural because mm. everyone cycles in their commutes like 10 minutes. So yeah. it's easy for them to come in, right? Yeah. In, in the States, it's completely different. So, last question, yeah. and it's probably one that you're going to go, Ooh, maybe you won't. Yeah, I can uh, walk out. I can just walk away. <laughs> yeah. I lose the temper. Where's the off button? Yeah. Do people have their own desks? Yeah. In oh, do people office. have their own desk? Yeah. No. No, they no, don't. No. So hot no. desk is... Not even the sea level, to be honest. Yeah. They just sit wherever. So that that's still gone. Yeah. In, in, in Miro. So you don't have a place, your own monitor. Because for designers, me in particular, like, I love having a big screen. Yeah. Um, well, they all have big screens. So they all, that's how you can't counter it. Yeah. Everyone has a big screen. Then yeah. when you plug in, you can... Yeah. And because we, we had that flexibility, we can just, oh, we need five more here. Okay. Do, do, do. We just added those. And the funny, funny enough okay. is when we opened this building, we didn't tell people where to go. We just said, okay. it's open, sit wherever you want to work, right? And let us know what you need. And they did. But you still, you see that a lot of departments have this habit. They go to the elevator, go to the, I don't know, the fourth floor and always sit in the same desk. It's not their desk, but it kind of claim Sales, it, right? Sales. No, not sales, right? It's, it's more towards design, product engineering, that, that angle. They, they love to work in neighborhoods. I remember it was 2009, 2010, the first time I ever in, sort of encountered hot desking. Yeah. And they're like, oh, it's be fine. And then the designers would be looking for little pockets of places to get together, like to have desks. Yeah. And then a salesperson would get in beside them and they'd be like, hello, how's it going? Can I speak to John today, please? And they're like, shut up, I'm trying to do my job. <laughs> well, no, this is a funny thing. We have... We had eight different typologies of rooms and one was the focus space, right? Large space, focus, so not a lot of talking. So we didn't bring up in a lot of acoustics. Okay. Because yeah. our thinking was, you will hear yourself talk and it feel uncomfortable, right? Yeah. The funny enough is sales claimed that space. 
right? Okay. And they do a lot of talking. So we brought in a lot of those phone booths, edit acoustics but later on. Is that not like a likelihood, a likely scenario maybe if mm -hmm. designers are coming in and then they're next to people who are chatters yeah. because they're they're extroverted and it's part of their role to be talking and like I'm trying to get that space. Even in the focus space, is that something that one happens and two, if it is a case that it's okay to say, do you mind leaving? We're trying to get work done here. Well, the, the, why we didn't we didn't steer on this? When yeah. the cool thing is, organically, people found their own spaces where they felt comfortable. And what they also did is, we're here. The full team likes it. We just selected it ourselves. It would be great if we can add. I don't know. Uh, a whiteboard or a panel here, or can we? So people separation? did kind of find their own kind of tribal space to yeah. to set up, yeah. even though it's in conflict with the plan. But so imagine it's... now fixed desks where I tell you you go there, yeah, and you're like, this is not nice. And they're talking, they're loud, right? Yeah. And now the feedback that you're going to give is more like, well, we don't like this space. Right, and okay. it's more from a negative point. Yeah. yeah. Instead of, hey, we found this. Um, I hope that's fine. It will be great if we can add this, that, and why? Yeah, I like. So it. it's it's a different way of providing feedback, and this was so cool for the workplace team because when they got that feedback, you're very inclined to help them out, and you're gonna add stuff, and they see you're adding, and the rest sees you're they're they're getting stuff, so they're gonna ask, and slowly, bit by bit. You're getting to something which is really cool and which really works. I mean, and what doesn't work? Yeah, right? yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. Well, look, Sid, um, I'm going to wrap up this. I, I know people listening to this podcast are going to have questions for Sid. I'm going to put a link to Sid's LinkedIn um, into the show notes and the description if you're watching it on YouTube for people to reach out because I know Sid is really interested in what you're doing as well. And if there's any questions, I'm sure you're okay to of answer. Course. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, um, again, listen, thanks for giving me your time, yeah, Renji. You're welcome. Um, and, you know, it's not easy to, you know, be put on the spot and for me to go left and right. So thanks for your vulnerability again yeah. for, for letting me do this. So, uh, yeah, Amazing. I'll put your link there to the LinkedIn. Thanks so much for your time. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Wow.